we've been looking at challenges, principles, and values of the Christian faith. So each week we've looked at different aspects and things that Jesus has taught us uh, through the word in Matthew. Last week we looked at the Beatitudes in chapter five. And this week in um, chapter six is where we want to pick up. Um, and Jesus is speaking here. This is a continuation of the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know if I shared that or not, to be honest, because we jumped right in last week. But if you look at uh, verse one in chapter five, he says, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And we did talk about that, but I don't know if I emphasize the fact that all of this uh, chapter and the next and the next is part of the Sermon on the Mount, as it's known, because he sat up on a mountaintop. He didn't have a bullhorn. He didn't have a, a system where he could blast his uh, speakers. He just supernaturally taught from that place and everyone was able to hear him. So when he gets to chapter number six, uh, he deals with a number of different topics related to the Christian faith. And these are very important because they get down to the nitty gritty of how we walk out, walk out. In particular, the first thing he focuses on is uh, verse number one through, what is it? Okay, pardon me because this whole thing is distracting me. Verses one through four deal with our charity, how we how we give, how we support, how we minister to others. And let's look at it. Chapter six, verse one says, Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. So there's a lot here, but for sake of time, I'm trying to hit it and quit it. Key thing is that we're not doing what we do to get uh, accolades or glory or uh, attaboys or to be honored by others. We're doing it unto the Lord. So when we bless people, when we serve them, we're serving God. In fact, I'll show you a scripture that speaks to that. But, but first, I want you to get this principle. We don't go out and blast it all over the place. You know, uh, corporate sponsors often give a certain percent of their profits to charities. Uh, and when they do, they want a lot of fanfare. You know, they want their names in the paper. They want pictures. Politicians do the same. You know, we showed up with food to give away or we made sure that you have this need or that need met we show up in the community what we're going to do we're going to bring our cameraman with us and we're going to take that picture so we can show our constituents what we're doing and there's not to say there's anything inappropriate per se but what god is saying is that your heart should be to please me not to please men not to impress others but simply that i may be glorified through your actions so when it says, do not do your charitable deeds before men, it doesn't mean you have to hide, but it means you don't go around boasting about it. You don't go around trying to spread it like, you know, look at how wonderful I am. Look what I did. I helped this homeless person. And I served this person. In the course of life, as you're sharing testimonies or as you're, you know, even encouraging others, there are times when you're going to naturally share some of the things that you've done but it's the motive behind it that's important. Is your motive to get yourself some glory or is it to let others know what God is doing, so to speak, that you joined in with him? Um, 
I had a situation like that over the weekend where I, where I gave away some things. I shared it with my neighbor because I wanted their hearts to get engaged so they would be buy in and become a part of it. So now they're going to give some things. And then I shared it with somebody else and they're going to give some things. So it was not, ooh, ooh, look at me, look what I did. It was more, look at this, what God is doing. Look at this opportunity God has given us. And so they sold in. Some of you, for example, joined me in helping our sister Janet Williams get air conditioning. She sent her newsletter out. I was so grateful to God as to how many have helped. But that's just one small part. She has five, I believe she said, bedrooms or more. And each one needs some air conditioning. Come on, you in a house, you know how hot we get. If they're running 111 degrees on a given day, and you got one room, guess where everybody's going to be <laughs> in that one room? But everybody can't be in her bedroom. So we want to, in the name of Jesus, believe God that he would touch more hearts, that we can give even more to help um, put out, uh, uh, meet the need for her to have air conditioning all over that building. That's a building where she ministers to people. That's a building where missionaries will be able to come and stay. So we want to sow into that. That's what God is doing. So when I mention, hey, I'm giving to this, in this context, it's not so you can say, oh, look how wonderful Reverend Carr is. No, it's so your heart can be pricked, hopefully, and you say, hey, let me get a piece of that. Let me join that. How many know you can't outgive God? That's the beautiful thing. Anytime you sow anything into God's kingdom, you're going to reap bountifully. But let me keep moving. So it says, otherwise you have no reward from your father. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before the hypocrites uh, for, uh, and to be that they may uh, have glory from men. Also, I say you, they have their reward. But when you do a deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, don't go around trying to boast. Don't try to make yourself look big just do it unto the father and because you did it unto him in a secret way he will honor you and and bless you and reward you openly now this is um as i said a principle if you think about it there's a couple of things that come to mind for me in other uh, whereas when we serve others, we're serving God. So therefore, we don't have to boast to anybody because it's God we're serving because God has been so good to us. We have nothing to boast about. But if you look in Hebrews, uh, for example, in the sixth chapter, I believe I want in the 10th verse, it says, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love but you have shown toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. So when you minister to others, you do those charitable deeds. He's saying, you did it unto my name and I'm not going to forget. I'm not unjust. So he will bless you because you have blessed others. We don't do it for that motivation. It's simply an offshoot or, or an overflow blessing because we do it out of the love of God. But God still will never let you give more than you receive. It's just his way. You plant a seed, you get a tree. You plant into his kingdom and he blesses you and, and protects you and keeps you. And you can read about that in Malachi and how he keeps you from having miscarriage and how he keeps your, your quiver full, so to speak. Um, he'll pour out so much blessing and said that you don't have room to receive it. The other thing that came to mind for me was Ephesians chapter two, because these things that we do, these charitable acts that we do, that's why we were created. That's part of why God birthed us into his kingdom. Yes, he wants us saved. Yes, we're going to heaven. But we live on earth right now. He has a purpose for it. If you look at in verse eight, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Not of works, not because of what you've done. In other words, you're not, doing charity to get saved you can't do enough work to get saved your your work is like trash so to speak compared to the level of sin that's uh, been forgiven when jesus died for your sin so nobody will be able to boast nobody will be able to say well i sang a choir i gave this much money and therefore i'm in heaven you came by your way in baby your righteousness is like a filthy rag Isaiah said in comparison to god's holiness 
So when we do our works, keep reading verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. See, he created us to do these things. And that's why we get a fulfillment and a contentment when we do them, because that's what we created for. We're, we're walking out our purpose. You know, a, a thing is created to do a particular thing. Uh, I believe it's Miles Moreau that says, if you use the thing to do something other than what it was created for, that's abuse. But in essence, if a car is created to drive on a road, we don't throw it in the water and ask it to swim like a boat or, sh or, or float like a boat. We honor the fact that it's created to be on land and roll. God created you for good works. That's why your heart feels a certain kind of way when you see someone in need. And then you talk yourself out of, well, you know, they'll get what they need from somewhere. Well, they shouldn't be out here begging anyway. Well, we talk ourselves out of being a blessing when it's that heart, that time that God pricks our heart, that is God's will that we do those good works and be a blessing to others. Don't worry about, oh, well, they might be this or they might be that, trying to hustle, whatever. If the Holy Spirit prompts your heart, I'm not saying you have to do something just because it's routine or rote, but because you feel a prick in your heart towards somebody, you're concerned, that's the spirit of God's grace. And the same way he gave us his grace freely, freely, we are to give it out freely. Okay? Now let's move forward. Chapter 6, verse 5 in Matthew says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue. Notice the pattern. When you give, don't do it all out to be seen like the hypocrites. Now he's saying when you pray, don't do it all out there to be seen and heard like the hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. That's not to say we can't have collective prayer because our goal in that instance is not to be seen. Our goal is that God would hear us, that we would be heard and that we would have power in our unity. But when we're in there trying to sound all deep and profound and impress people, we're not praying to God, we're praying to those people that are listening. And there are people who pray like that. Uh, it says, let me keep reading. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and when you have your shut your door, pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So let's look at that. Same way God said, don't go out trying to boast and show everybody how you're giving stuff or doing whatever charitable work. Likewise, don't go around trying to impress people with your deep and profound sounding prayers. If you're seeking my face, get in your prayer closet. And I see, excuse me, I hear you. I see you in secret and I will reward you openly. That's the beauty. Look at both instances. You do it in secret, but I bless you in the open because your heart is right toward me. I'm going to bless you. And then he says in verse seven, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. So again, just like he told us earlier in the chapter, you know, don't be out there blowing your trumpet, trying to sound impressive, trying to get people to look at you. No, when you pray, you do it unto the Father in secret. Again, there are appropriate times when we pray in public. We're having a, a prayer meeting. Uh, we do John 3.16. That's a time we come together collectively, specifically to pray. But we're not on there trying to impress anybody. We're on there trying to reach our God and to intercede one for another. And we are celebrating when he hears us and answers us and moves. And we are uh, praising God. Even this day, I'm praising God for his hearing us collectively as we you know, see testimonies coming in on our prayer wall of the favor and the uh, grace of God. So those are not times when we're doing it to be seen or to be boastful or to try to impress people. We're doing it because we come together as a ministry. That's a time that's okay. Or like if you went to church and uh, First Baptist, for example, we have what we call prayer and praise. There's a time in our service where we'll pull everybody and we pray. That's appropriate. We're not doing it to show. We're doing it because we're seeking the face of God. And we are doing it collectively. But our motive is the key thing. God is looking at your heart. What is the motive of your heart? 
when you share it with somebody? Is it to boast or is it to let people know the things of God to encourage them to be engaged in the things of God, to draw them into the things of God? When you're doing that, you become a source for more blessings, uh, whether it's giving charitably or, or seeking, um, praying and interceding for somebody. You then become a conduit, a, a, like a discipler in essence, because you're using your experience to help others draw nigh to him. But what's the key thing? He said, go ahead, get in your secret place. You should have a place in your house where you can get in God's face. You know, sometimes I've gone in my closet even <laughs> when things get tough, especially when my kids were little. I'd go hide in the closet, go in the bathroom, go wherever I had to go. Um, now that they're older, I can sit in my chair quietly <laughs> and don't have to worry about that. But the key is that you have a place where you can get with God and see his hand at work and, and have a conversation with him. Uh, you know, that old song, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your problems. When you get in that secret place, that place that's only with you and God, if you really do it uh, on a consistent basis, even in a place, some of you probably remember that movie um, War Room where the lady was um, selling her house and she had a little prayer closet and the man came in, he was like, hmm, he could feel the presence of the Lord in that prayer closet. He said, we want this house. He didn't even see all the rest of it. He said, we want this because he could feel the presence of God. You know, the atmosphere can be salted down. It's like a church when you, year after year, you begin to create a sanctuary for God's presence. So when people walk in, they feel the presence of the Lord. I remember years ago when one of the pastors I used to watch was talking about how when they first moved into a warehouse kind of place they were converting, so it just felt, felt empty and cold, and he just began to praise God right there and begin to set the atmosphere. So in your home, you can create that same thing. Set aside a place where you can talk to God, where you can cry out to him. I thought about Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. There's a place in Christ that's just between you and him that you get in his face, you cry out to him. Like I said, for me right now, it's a chair and I can go before God there. I can pray. He meets me there, so to speak. All right. So what else does he tell us? He tells us not to be doing vain repetitions. Uh, my father, my God, who... Um, didn't let my, what is it? Didn't, I thank you that you woke me up this morning, started me on my way. Didn't let my bed be my, my cooling board. I mean, there's like a whole run that people have. They know it by heart. They whip it off. But it has no meaning. I don't want to say it don't mean it. Then it can skip your heart and just be an intellectual exercise. That's a vain repetition when you just say, say stuff over and over and over, but it's no longer having a, an impact on your heart, so to speak. You just repeat because you heard somebody else repeat. That's the way the deacons always pray. Or that's the way my mother always prayed. And I ain't mad at your mom. I'm just simply saying <laughs> you want to pray from your heart and not just repeat stuff, you know, over and over just because, you know, our father, um, thank you for this bread. Thank you for this food. Uh, some people, good Lord, good meat. What is it? Good food, good meat, good Lord, let's eat. <laughs> it's like there's no true meaning there's no prick of their heart when they're praying they're not stopping to really say thank you father for this meal thank you that you blessed me again thank you that you made provision you know there's a difference between just some rote exercise that you just repeat babbling so to speak god calls that a hypocrite and we don't want to be like the hypocrites we want to pray with a fresh prayer because today's situation is different from yesterday's or even if it's the same, it's a new day. So I got a new thing to say to God. I got some things that are on my heart today and I need to talk to God about them. I'm not just going to repeat. We don't want God to give us the same stuff, so to speak, with no concern about where we are today. What I needed when I was three ain't the same as what I need right now uh, in terms of some of the details. So we want to be indeed particular with God and personal with God. Okay. So we don't want to be like the hypocrites. Now, if we keep moving, it says in verse 8, Therefore do not be like them, for your father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. 
that's always been an interesting thing to me because it's on the one hand, well, God, if you already know what I need, what do I need to ask for? And yet on the other hand, it's my heart understanding that God wants me to come to him so that we have a relationship, so that we can build our intimacy and so that I can appreciate the fact that he has heard me specifically for what I need. And sometimes we have not because we ask not, the scripture says, and we try to do it on our own, Sarah. Oh, well, God ain't worked it out to give me a baby here. Abraham labored, hey God, let me start a mess trying to fix it myself. You know, start with prayer. That doesn't mean that we don't have any part to play. God may indeed give you some direction. There might be some part you have to pray, have to do. I remember that old uh, saying about two little girls were late for school. And one of them said, well, let's stop and pray. And the other one said, no, let's pray while we run. In other words, I still got to do my part and do what I can. But it's his super that's added to my natural. But watch this. I have found that even with my part, I want to be led by the Holy Ghost. I don't want to just go do what I think off the top of my head. Because as I sit and I pray about it for a minute, the Holy Spirit may show me something that I didn't think of. He might take me in a different direction. And so that's the consequence of taking a moment to really pray to seek his face so that indeed when he uh, moves in my direction, it's according to his perfect will and not just me leaning on my own understanding. Uh, it's so important to hear the Holy Spirit, at least for me. Uh, he came to, he was sent to guide me into all truth, to bring to my remembrance the things that the Lord taught. So why would I try to do it on my own? Why would I not look for him to guide me? Yes, the father knows what I need, but I also know that even in my prayer life, I want him to guide me by his spirit. So what does he tell us? He says, therefore, in verse nine, in this manner, therefore pray. I want you to get this. If you look in the other version in Luke, uh, the parallel for this, Luke uh, chapter 11, verse two through four, you see that same um, reference to Jesus telling them how to pray. Why is this? Could you try again? Oh, oh, have mercy. This is the beauty of having phones that can listen. Um, Sorry, I'm still not sure about that. Okay, I need you to be quiet. Um, so sorry. Anyway, Luke chapter 11, verse 2 through 4. I'm going to go over this in verse 1 of chapter 11. It says, Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place. When he ceased, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, When you pray, say. So the same occurrence, but two different angles. We know the synoptic gospels; those are parallel, meaning that they're the same things being talked about by and large, but they're looked at from different angles. So if I'm here and Plachette's here, and Plachette talks about what this class was about, her angle is different from mine. I'm teaching it, so my, my view is different. So likewise, Luke had a different perspective than Matthew, but it was the same event. And so Luke is letting us know that the disciples asked Jesus, how do we pray? And I want you to look at two things. First of all, he said, when you pray, say, open your mouth and pray. Yes, there are times when we pray silently, but there also be some times when we open our mouth and pray. Read in the book of Revelation, when we get to heaven, it ain't gonna be no quiet little church mouse kind of place. There's gonna be some loud praising and praying going on. So I encourage you, open your mouth and pray. Let the Lord hear your voice and he, so he can incline his ear to your cry. Uh, if you look back at chapter Matt, uh, six of Matthew, I want you to note this in verse nine. In this manner, then, therefore pray. Why is that important? Because it is a model prayer in this manner, in this way, in this pattern, if you will. Don't pray word for word because that's not to say you're not sinning if you pray word for word, but you miss the fullness of the intent. I'm giving you a model, a manner of prayer so you'll know how you pray in terms of the kinds of things you need to pray about. Because 
you can even make this one of those hypocritical things and just rituals that you say that misses your heart and just goes through your mind, but you don't even hear it anymore because you just say it over and over and over. You know, there are people who only read Psalm 23. Oh, I read Psalm 23 every night not before I go to bed. That's the only scripture they read. But that's kind of like all I eat is chocolate ice cream. Every day I eat chocolate ice cream. That's it. You know, yes, it's a blessing to have chocolate ice cream sometime, but you want to have the fullness of God's heart and his mind. So likewise, Jesus is saying, this is just a pattern that I want you to follow. So what does he tell us? He says, first of all, our father. Oh, wait a second before I go there. I made note of a couple of things. One is it says, uh, I wanted you to know that when you look at the first three, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. I'm sorry, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. Those three speak to his kingdom being brought to earth. Then when you look at the second ones, forgive us our debts. Do not lead us into temptation. Deliver us from evil. What's he looking at? These are the needs we have as we await his kingdom to come to earth. So note that distinction between the two sections, if you will, of this model prayer. Now, let's go forward. All right, so now what do we see? We see it says that the challenges, principles and values of Christian faith in this instance is focused on the father, the uh, Hebrew word pater, I think I'm saying it right, or in Greek, Abba, uh, that's daddy for some of us. Um, some would say that's too familiar, you know, some theologians, well, that's too childlike and too familiar, but I would say that it's an intimacy, to the same principle of daddy is, not that I'm some little kid that doesn't have understanding, because even when, as an adult, I still call my daddy daddy. Um, it is a reverence, but it's also personal. It's in, in, in an intimate term is we have a relationship. That's that's what distinguishes us from those who don't know God. Remember in John 17 and three, uh, this is eternal life that they may know you. Uh, God's desire is that we have a relationship. And so Jesus is saying, my father, I'm praying to you. And then he goes on, he say, in heaven. Why is that necessary? Doesn't God know where he is? Surely he does. But I believe it's necessary because he needs to distinguish in case there's anybody else confused in his midst when he says, I'm teaching you this pattern. Because there were a lot of other entities around that prayed to a lot of other little G gods. You know, uh, they prayed to all kinds of demonic gods. They prayed to the God of the sun and the moon and so on and so forth. Even I've heard people call Satan their God, their, their father. So we want to be clear that our father is the father who is in heaven. He is the maker of heaven and earth. He's almighty God. We're not praying to anybody you talking about if you're not talking about the God that we know. So he specifies his identity. He's in heaven. What does he say? Hallowed be your name. Hallowed. What does that mean? To make holy, to sanctify, to consecrate, to, to esteem or, or reverence, if you will, uh, as as being unique and high and above all in other words we don't just treat your name lightly we honor your name and so hallowed be your name um, there are some even in the jewish and other faith groups that won't even say the word god they won't write it they'll write g d uh, because they deem it to be so hallowed and so sanctified I'm so glad that Jesus said, hallowed be thy name, Father, because that lets me know that I'm allowed to be personal and intimate with my dad. Okay. Then he goes on to say, your kingdom come. What's that mean? God is inviting us to invite his, invoke his presence in our everyday life. When you're living this earthly um, life, you're a spiritual being, but you're living in a world that's fallen. 
Uh, Jesus said he didn't pray for us in John 17 that God would take us out of the world. He said, I pray that you would uh, bless them while they're in the world, that they would be in the world, but not of the world. In other words, God, we want to live like your kingdom, like it is in heaven. We want it here on earth. We are inviting you to earth. We are inviting your presence. We are inviting your kingdom to rule and to reign. That means that we're willing to submit ourselves to your will in the earth realm. We want your will to be done, almighty God. In our lives, in our country, in our nation, uh, if you will, in our on this globe, we want a universal uh, presence of your kingdom. Imagine if we all operated in kingdom principles. There would be no need for AK. 47s or whatever, you know, going in this building, shooting people up and having all this uh, murder and, and mayhem that we see in the earth because God's kingdom is not ruled. But when God's kingdom is ruled, meaning that we yield ourselves, we surrender, we become his children, then his will can be done on earth. And the more of us that come into his kingdom, the more his kingdom can reign on earth until ultimately, you know, when he returns, it will be completely and yielded to him because every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. You can bow now or you can bow later, but you will bow in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we know that God's will be done is what our desire is. What does it say? On earth as it is in heaven. I want to see your will, God. I want to see your presence. I want to see your power operate in my life. When I lay hands on the sick, I want to see you move. I want to uh, pray and know that you will answer. I want to see peace on earth. I want your will to be done, God. You say, when I pray here, it will be done here and in heaven. So I'm praying that what's done in heaven would be manifest here. All of these are the things that God is uh, Jesus is telling us to pray for. So again, why we don't just say, God, let your will be done on earth, but you might say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, let your will be done in my life, in this situation, in, in this marriage, God. You say, my husband should love me as Christ loved the church, as I submit to him in all things. Help us to align ourselves with your will. Help your will to manifest that when people see us, oh God, you would be glorified because we represent the relationship between you and your bride. That's praying that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That God, this baby who's sick, a million, Lord, that you would heal her, that you would raise her up, God. You said that that is not of you. That sickness is not of you, oh God. And it's your will. You're willing that she be healed. You've told a man who had leprosy, it, you're willing to heal us, oh God. So let your will be done in Amelia's life. Bring healing to her right now. Strengthen her right now. Bless her right now, God. Let your will be made manifest on earth in Amelia's life as it is in heaven. Because there's no sickness in heaven. There's no brokenness in heaven. There's no tears in heaven, oh God. So bring heaven to earth in her life, even now, in Jesus' name. That's why we pray when we pray God's will be done on earth. Then he goes on to say, give us this day our daily bread. Notice he didn't say, um, give us yesterday's bread. Give us the bread for next week. Give us this day our daily bread. Why is that important? Because that means, first of all, I'm praying every day. I'm recognizing that I need him every day. I, I'm recognizing that I can't do anything without him today. I'm I'm in need of his move. I'm in need of his power. I'm in need of his love today. I'm in need of his provision today. Uh, today is really all I got because tomorrow's not promised. So I can't focus on tomorrow. I need him to move today. And I need you, God, to give me what I need today. Uh, I love the fact that uh, we can go to him according to what we need today. See, what I needed yesterday might be a little different than what I did. Today, I need your energy. I need your peace, oh God. I need your strength today, God. Give me today my daily bread. I need you to provide for my every need today. So those are legit prayers because they speak to where I am today. If I just roll that off, Lord, you know, give me this day my daily bread, well, I, it may not even register to me to deal specifically and ask specifically 
for what I need today. And so we, again, as Jesus said, don't want to pray just rote prayers where we just constantly say things over and over and over without having any true meaning to them. Okay. So he says, um, forgive us our sin debt. And notice even before I go there, think back to the Old Testament daily bread. Man, God showered it down each day, but at night it rotted. So you couldn't keep it for the next day. That's a word for us to know. Yesterday's prayers, they took care of yesterday, but you need to get in my face today and hear from me and ask me for what you need. So he says, forgive us our debt as we forgive our debt to us. Well, what debt? Well, we have a sin debt. Every time we sin, we deserve death. What does Romans 26-23 say? The wages of sin is death. So there's something I owe. There's a debt that I create when I sin. And so he's saying, ask the Lord to forgive you. Yes, in this dispensation, we have been blessed because this was before his death. We have been blessed with Jesus' blood being poured out for our sins. But yet, watch this, there's still a reason to ask for forgiveness in this context, not for sake of salvation, because that sin is no longer counted against me, but for sake of relationship and fellowship. It's kind of like if you are married or if you have a child or if you have a friend or you have a coworker, you offend them. You know you did something they don't like. Whether you say I'm sorry or not, they're still going to be your coworker. They're still going to be your friend if they truly are your friend. And they're still going to be your daughter. They're still going to be your husband, your brother, your friend, your neighbor, whatever. That relationship doesn't disappear, presumably, if it's a strong relationship of any covenant level. Um, but there's a brokenness in the fellowship. Because if you don't say I'm sorry, there might be some days where there's some sucking of teeth and some rolling of eyes and some cold shouldering and all that until we get over it. But if you go and say, you know what, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said it that way, or I'm sorry, I, I missed it. Then there's a reconciliation. The relationship didn't change, but the fellowship shifted. So likewise, even with God in this season, we still want to say, Lord, forgive me for dishonoring you. And watch this, forgive me my sin that as I forgive others who owe me. What does that mean? My debtors, those who sin against me, I'm willing to forgive them, Lord, as you have forgiven me. And we have to be very mindful of that because we have a way of being somehow, um, what's the word I want? Amnesia is the word I want. <laughs> we, we, we think, oh, okay, God, you know, you forgave my sins, it's okay, but... When it comes to everybody else, we remember everything. You know, we don't want to forget anything. Yeah, I remember that time 10 years ago when you said so-and-so. We don't want to let people off the hook, but we want God to let us off the hook. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you want to be forgiven, God said, then ask to be forgiven and then do the same to others. Forgive them. Don't come in here with a holier-than-thou attitude toward them. You know, you should know better. You're supposed to be a Christian. That's one of my favorite lines. You're supposed to be a Christian. That means what? I'm supposed to walk on water. I got to be perfect all the time. No, I'm not going to be perfect all the time. I'm doing better than I was 10 years ago because you think I'm a mess now. Lord, you'd have really been messed up 10 years ago. But I'm saying I still haven't arrived. And so therefore, be patient with me, God. This is, we need one of them signs. Christian under construction. God is not through with me yet. And so the same way I can show you grace, show me grace. The same way God has forgiven you, forgive me. And then we do the same one for another. What did he tell Peter when he said, well, how many times I got to forgive him? Seventy times? He thought he was saying something. Oh, like, that's a lot. Jesus said, no, 70 times, seven times. So uh, when he said seven times, pardon me, 70 times, seven times. In other words, until he stopped doing it to keep forgiving. And most of us are pretty hard-hearted, and we don't want to hear that, but that's the reality of God's will, because that's what he does for you every day. Here's the question. How much of his forgiveness do you need? Do you want him to say, oh, well, I forgave you most of that, but this particular thing, you really hurt me bad. I, I just, I can't, I can't let it go. 
Is that what you want him to say to you? Because that's what you say to others. If you're not looking to God to treat you that way, then don't treat anybody else that way. Ephesians 4.32, what does it say? Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. So you want to be kind, you want to be compassionate, you want to reap what you sow, because the same measure you use to others is what's going to be measured back to you. Okay? Let me move forward. Verse 13, do not lead us into temptation. Oh, before I go, I put quid pro, quo pro. What's that uh, Latin term mean? This for that. When I was in law school, that was one of our, you know, when you're a rookie in law school, you learn these certain terms and you just get all excited because all of a sudden you know something. Uh, this was one of those as the first years we always got excited about this queer pro. It just sounded so deep. It's really not that deep, but it sounded deep. Uh, they said this for that. What's this? Forgive me for what's that? Me forgiving others. That's what God's word is telling us. Let it go, Louis. All right. Then what does he say? Do not lead us into temptation. Lord, you've forgiven me. Now keep me clean. <laughs> keep me out of the way of the devil's traps. Keep my flesh, help me keep my flesh out of subjection. Oh God, I need you to help me. Don't lead me into temptation. You know, it's an interesting concept, but in Luke 4, Jesus was led into the wilderness. I think we looked at it earlier in Matthew as well. He was led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. That's deep. The Holy Spirit doesn't tempt us, but he led him in to be tempted. Lord, don't lead me to temptation. That's what we're saying. Please, just help me. I, I don't need no temptation. Just keep me humble. Help me to walk right. Don't lead me into temptation. Because I know the world is evil, God. I know I'm surrounded by carnality. I know that uh, there's so much going on. I need you to guide me. I need you to keep me uh, focused. I need you to help me to live a life that's not yielded to sin. And, and the truth is that we can't do that without the Holy Spirit's power. We can't do that without his strength. And so we need him to help us. And then he goes on to say, but deliver us from evil. We know there's evil in the world. There's a lot of evil in the world. There's fallen angels. We know them as demons in the world. We know the devil roams around like a worn lion seeking to who he may devour, see who he can devour. We know there is evil. When people yield to the enemy, the soul, their soul to the devil, they do evil. Sometimes they don't even know they're yielding. You know, like when Peter was saying to Jesus, oh, no, you know, that'll never happen to you. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Because he recognized Peter was yielding himself unwittingly to the devil. Because the devil would have told him, oh, no, don't follow God's will. Peter was like, no, that'll never happen to you. When he told him he had to be uh, crucified and buried. Because that's nothing but the devil trying to keep me from doing what my father told me to do is what Jesus was saying. So likewise, there are times when we are unwittingly allowing the devil to use us. We get in our flesh, we get angry, and we allow ourselves to be used. And so we don't want to do that. So we want to pray, Lord, help me to stay away from evil. Help me to die to myself. Help me not to be an instrument of wickedness, or uncleanness of any sort. You know, uh, help me, Lord. I don't want to fall prey to the devil's schemes or his wiles, his uh, deception. In Revelation 12 and 9, what does it say? So the great drape, the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth. So the devil's in the business of deceiving. He will lead the whole world astray, if possible. So we have to be prayed up, keeping our hearts and our minds stayed on God so that we don't get deceived. Lord, keep me from being deceived by the enemy and by my flesh. Because guess what? The enemy often is in a me because I'm the one that's wanting those things that are not of you. And therefore I yield myself to get what I know you tell me not to get, trying to satisfy my own flesh. So help me, God, deliver me from evil. And then what is he going to say? 
for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. What do we know about that? We know that God's kingdom is the greatest kingdom of all. There's a lot of little K kingdoms out here. There's some human kingdoms being built up. We, we want to be known as the greatest church, or we want to be known as the greatest building, or we want to be known as whatever. You know, I want to be known as the greatest speaker on earth or whatever. You know, we build our own little kingdoms. But God's word, Jesus is saying, no, it is your kingdom that we want to reign. And it is your kingdom that we rep be recognized is the kingdom, is the power, is the one that's worthy of our glory forever. Uh, and, and some scholars taught us in the first chronicles, if you go back, first chronicles chapter number 29 and verse number 11. Let's look at that real quick. And pray for my daughter who's having a fit with these bugs. Lord have mercy. I don't know who's going to hurt her more, herself or the bugs. Anyway, <laughs> First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11. Then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vestibule, his house, his treasuries, his upper chambers, his chambers, and the place of the mercy seat, and the plans for all that he had by the spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord. Of all the chambers, all of oh Lord Jesus, I'm reading the wrong chapter. My bad. Pardon me. Saying, well, what am I reading? That don't sound right. I'm looking at 28:11 instead of 29:11. Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O oh Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. So Jesus is just reiterating what's already been established, that it is God's kingdom, that it's God's power, that he is the one who created heaven and earth, that all of this belongs to him. So it's his kingdom. And we know the enemy desires to destroy it, to get, up off, get us off course, to deceive us so that we forfeit what God has for us. And if you look at 1 John 4, 4, of course, we know the scripture, some of us by heart, that uh, he is greater um, than anything that's in this world. Let me look at it. First John 4, 4 says, But you are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So his kingdom is greater. So his is the kingdom, his is the power, his is the glory. For how long? Forever. He was in the beginning and he will be in the end. He is the alpha and the omega. So he is he who is and was and is to come. His is the kingdom and the power forever. Amen and amen and amen. So that model is the model we want to use when we pray. Oops, did I duplicate myself? Okay. So the next thing we see is fasting. In verse number 16, let me hurry up because I got to wrap this up. It says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in a secret place. There's that word again. And your father who sees in secret will what? Reward you openly. Notice the pattern. When we do things unto the Lord, not to give a show, then God rewards our secret uh, solemnness, our humility and he blesses us openly. He don't do the blessing in secret. So everybody say, man, that chick is blessed. That dude got it going on. Look at the favor on his life. Why? Because he handled his business inside. God works it out on the outside. I sound like a sermon. Good God Almighty. When we do it unto God, we don't do it so everybody can say, we don't walk around sad. Say, say, what's wrong? Oh, I'm fasting. I'm so hungry. I'm so weak. No, we anoint our head. For those who are not familiar with anointing oil, 
that is the consecrated oil, that's uh, olive oil. If you think back to the Garden of Gethsemane, it was filled with olives uh, grows. It was an olive grove. Olives always represented the presence of the uh, Holy Spirit, the presence and the power of God. Um, that's why demons tremble when you you anoint a person that's filled with a devil. Oh, that devil got to go. He can't handle that oil. You cover yourself, and you don't have to wait till you fast. Each morning when you get up, get a bottle of uh, uh, olive oil consecrated to the Lord. What do I mean by that? If this is my olive oil, I'm saying, Father, bless this. I set it apart as holy unto you. So that when I put it on my head, it represents your presence in my life. So each morning you can do that. You don't have to wait till you're fasting, but you should fast. Every one of us should set aside some time to fast on a regular basis. When God prompts you to set aside, some people have a day of the week, every Thursday, every Monday, whatever, that's their fast day. Set aside some time to fast. It will give you power. It will give you anointing. It will help you to stay focused on the things of God. So we anoint our head. We wash our face so we don't walk around with a big old, I've seen people walk around with a big old blob of grease on their head so we can know, oh, they fast. That ain't what the Holy Spirit said. He said, wash your face. I don't need to even know that you're anointed. You ain't got to walk around with a big old swab of oil so everybody can see. No, anoint your head with oil and then wash your face, he says, because what you do to God in secret, he will reward you openly. And there's something about fasting. That's a whole nother teaching, but I will say this. It's like the nuclear weapon of prayer. When you fast, you die to yourself. You put your flesh out of the way. You totally focus on the things of God. Your prayers take it up another notch. Okay. I think we got to end it. Ooh, look at God. We didn't get, I know there was, Oops, let me go back here. So we got one part we didn't get to um, look at, but we'll pick that up next time. So when we fast, when we pray, uh, we do it unto the Lord in secret. He rewards us. Now. But before we go to prayer, we always want to make sure that anyone who is with us has an opportunity to say yes to the Lord. Uh, that means that if you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, this is the time that we invite you to do that. Uh, I got a text from someone today saying, I, I don't know if I'm going to heaven. And I'm telling them, you can know. How can you know? Well, the Bible tells you you can know. Because some people say, oh, nobody really knows whether you're going to heaven or not. Well, I beg to differ because the Bible is very clear about it. If you look in 1 John chapter 5, it's in verse 11 says, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may over and that you may continue to believe in the name of the son of God. So yes, you can know you have eternal life. It's kind of like being pregnant. You can't be kind of pregnant. You either pregnant or you ain't pregnant. There ain't no kind of like, I think I'm sort of kind of pregnant. No, it don't work like that. If you're pregnant, you're pregnant. If you're not, you're not. You either have the son or you don't. He who has the son has eternal life. He who does not, does not have eternal life. So do you have the son? Have you understood and accepted him as your savior? If you have, then you have eternal life. If you have not, you do not have eternal life. It's very simple. So if there's anyone amongst us who's never said yes, never accepted Jesus so that you know you have eternal life, you have a question in your mind, then you need to let me know tonight because we don't want you to be walking around with that question mark. The thing I believe about God is there are no accidents with him. When he allows you to encounter a certain person, it's for a reason. He allowed you to interact with me, come across my path to make sure you know who he is. And his desire is that you have a relationship with him. 